Good afternoon. Um, I'm Elizabeth Anderson. I'm the Executive Director of the American Society of International Law. And welcome to our Taylor House headquarters. Um, if you all want, please feel free to move on up. We're going to have a little video here, and it might be easier to see if you're closer in. And then folks who arrive late can fill in in the back. Um, as I say, it's really a pleasure to have you here um, for the first of three continuing legal education programs on human rights that we are organizing um, this month together with the American University Washington College of Law, Human Rights and Humanitarian Law Academy. Um, we're really delighted to have this partnership with ADU in this series and in a whole range of other activities throughout the year. Um, those of you who are not familiar with the American Society, there are materials on your chairs uh, about us and we'd love to have you join and be a part of our community on an ongoing basis. There's also a flyer for another program um, on human rights that will be of interest to you on your chair. In addition to the three CLEs that we're organizing with American University, we have a, a series that we organize throughout the summer. We call it our Summer Associate Series because it's, it's geared uh, in particular for summer, um, summer associates, students who are um, in summer jobs here in Washington. Um, but this is one that will be of interest um, to a broader community, certainly to a human rights community. It's going to be uh, Harold Coe discussing the legal advisor of the State Department, um, uh, discussing the recent case of um, the dissident Chen from uh, China. So um, that's also coming up in the next uh, week or so. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have um, our speakers here today. Um, they are old friends of mine. We just realized we're all um, all have our roots at uh, Human Rights Watch and even overlapped there a little bit. Reed and I um, for quite a, quite a period. Um, and one a little bit, um, and we've all also um, co-taught uh, courses at the American University um, uh, Human Rights and Humanitarian Law Academy. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over in a minute to uh, uh, Professor Mendez to introduce the whole program, but I will um, sing their praises a little bit, because I know they'll be too modest to do so. But you really have here today um, two of the leading thinkers and actors in our, in our contemporary human rights um, movement. Um, and uh, Professor Mendez is a professor at American University of Washington College of Law. Um, he also serves as a special rapporteur on torture for the UN. Um, he has a long and distinguished career in the human rights field, among many positions serving as general counsel of Human Rights Watch, as the executive director of the International Center for Transitional Justice um, before his current um, role at AU. So it's really a pleasure to have Professor Mendez as our moderator. And um, Reed Brody is our expert uh, on the Hassan Habre case. Um, Reed has really spent a decade or more on uh, this case, knows more about it than anyone. We had at the ASAL annual meeting this spring, and it was um, organized under a theme of confronting complexity in international law. And there were a few panels that were dedicated to particular cases that where it seemed to have wound their way from tribunal to tribunal and court to court and really uh, involved a complex web of politics and law and domestic and international jurisdiction. And I was thinking in, it, uh, in advance of today's program, we should have had a panel on the Santa Habre case because it is um, such a, a very interesting case um, in this uh, long quest for justice, and Reed will tell us about it. Um, so without further introduction, welcome to Teller House, and I'll turn it over to uh, Juan. Thank you very much, uh, Betsy. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here in this house, but also a great honor to moderate for my good friend, uh, Reed Brody. Uh, today's topic is uh, universal jurisdiction. And uh, we are uh, we're very lucky, fortunate to have uh, Reed talk about it because very few people have dedicated so many efforts to uh, this important principle. Um, obviously, as a basis of jurisdiction, inter uh, universal jurisdiction has been widely accepted in international law for a long time. At the same time, uh, it was kind of theoretical until the arrest of General Augusto Pinochet in, in London, pursuant to an arrest warrant and an extradition request from Spain uh, for crimes committed in Chile and not necessarily only against uh, Spanish citizens. So it was uh, the first time that a very prominent uh, um, case was uh, 
uh, tested under universal jurisdiction. All of you know the outcome of that, uh, but as you can imagine, that generated an important uh, flow of resources and energy by the human rights community to, to continue to use universal jurisdiction and sooner rather than later, of course, that became very controversial. Um, and uh, especially when the possible subjects of apprehension were very prominent uh, uh, world leaders like Henry Kissinger uh, and others. Um, because of the controversy, um, you know, we, uh, we're always thinking through whether universal jurisdiction uh, is worth the effort or not. But I would submit at least that uh, universal jurisdiction becomes, uh, is still very much uh, a pillar of the efforts to avoid impunity. And avoiding impunity is the name of the human rights movement today. Um, it's obviously universal jurisdiction is not the only leg to stand on to, to prevent impunity from happening, uh, but with um, the uh, fight against impunity in domestic jurisdiction and now with the creation of the International Criminal Court and be before it the ad hoc courts, uh, we, we have rounded up uh, not, not only a, a very widely accepted doctrine of fight against impunity, but also mechanisms and instruments by which we can make it a reality. In that uh, scenery, uh, universal jurisdiction still has a place uh, and has a, uh, an important place because uh, one important aspect of uh, avoiding impunity is making sure that there is no safe haven for torturers, uh, 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 killers, people who uh, command or authorize or, or uh, uh, instigate major crimes against humanity and war crimes. Uh, I think in, with that uh, very you know, modest introduction, um, I think uh, it's, a, uh, it's important to, to analyze uh, universal jurisdiction in the light of uh, most recent developments and the uh, Hissène Abre case uh, is a, a very important test case for uh, the international community's uh, willingness to consider universal jurisdiction as a way of uh, um, both uh, punishing but also preventing major uh, crime, war crimes and crimes against humanity. So with that, um, I invite uh, Reed to address you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Juan and Betsy. Juan Mendez, one of my heroes uh, in the human rights movement. Um, Betsy and I, uh, we were just reminiscing that uh, some 17, uh, wait, 19, some 15. 15 years ago, we began a campaign to uh, bring to justice the fugitive, the, those who were indicted by the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal, a campaign called Arrest Now. And, and just last week, the, the trial of uh, Radko Mladic began, and uh, kind of bringing to closure that, that camp long campaign. Every, we, we had a map showing where all of the uh, uh, indictees were hiding out in Yugoslavia, and we, we, the map showed which armies, the British Army, French Army, American Army, um, were garrisoned and, and patrolling in, next to which, uh, next to which uh, indictees as kind of way of shaming them into taking the action necessary. And, and it, it's wonderful to, to, to know that actually every single person on that map um, is now, with the exception of a few who have died, every single person on that map is now in custody and, and most of them have been tried. Um, so, um, you know, this is, we are living in a, in a very interesting moment for international justice today. Charles Taylor was um, uh, sentenced to 50 years, uh, the Mladic trial began. Um, this case, I, I, I've lost all my bets. I bet, I bet a colleague at Human Rights Watch that Hissen Habre would be brought to justice before Charles Taylor. <laughs> and I've lost by many years. Um, uh, as, as, as Betsy said, this is a case that has um, gone through the courts of 
uh, Senegal, the courts of Belgium, um, to some extent the courts of Chad, the UN Committee Against Torture, the African Court for Human Rights, uh, the African uh, uh, the Court of Justice of, of ECOWAS, uh, and most recently, uh, two months ago, um, we spent two weeks in The Hague um, as a case, uh, the case of Belgium versus Senegal, um, which revolved around the fate of Hissen Havre, was debated at the International Court of Justice. Um, it's also been debated at the African Union, the European Union. The only place, unfortunately, that we haven't gotten to is a criminal court um, to try Hissen Havre yet. And, and that's, of course, uh, what this is all about. Um, before I, I begin, I want to show a, a six-minute video clip, which is taken from a movie about the case, because I think it's useful to kind of get a picture of, of, of what it is that we're talking about and what the crimes involved are, and then give you, a, I hope, a, a feeling. Hissen Habre has been called the Pinochet of Africa. He ruled Chad with an iron fist for eight years. He's accused of human rights violations, including imprisonment without trial and the systematic use of torture. After Habre fled the country, investigators discovered mass graves in the desert and accused the dictator of the deaths of more than 40,000 of his fellow Chadians. The trial of Hissen Habre could be the first in which a former African dictator is actually prosecuted in another African country and would mark the end of an international manhunt that has taken more than 10 frustrating years. In the Christian part of the city lives one of the key witnesses for the prosecution, Clement Abefuta. He and four other prisoners were ordered to bury the victims of the regime. These barren fields became a huge secret cemetery. And right now we are coming to the common grave and from here on it is just corpses from the common grave to wait at the back it's just all corpses every day it was 7, 8, 10, 20, 30, 40, yeah, every day. He personally buried more than a thousand people over the course of four years. It was his testimony that led to the discovery of the first mass graves. This footage, which dates from 1991, has never been seen before. A few months after Habre's fall, investigators organized searches at the Plain of the Dead. They discovered more than 30 skeletons at the precise spot where Abai Futa said he had dug a common grave. These are some depictions of the abuses, as sketched by an ex-prisoner. The goal was to extract confessions by any means necessary. Jeanette Mbaye was four months pregnant when she was arrested. For one week, she too was tortured, this time with electric currents. They put the electric wire here here and here on my breast and I fainted without even realizing it did you tell them you were pregnant yes I told them I was pregnant but they didn't care about that Brody visited N'Djamena the capital of Chad in 2001 11 years after Habre's overthrow when he came across old files left by the documentation and security agency, the notorious DDS, he knew he'd struck gold. This has to do with detentions, with arrests, with search warrants, with spying reports. In 2006, the African Union demanded Senegal hold Habre's trial in Dakar. Since then, however, nothing has happened. Today, September the 16th, 2008, marks a new attempt to force the Senegalese into taking action. 
The victims and their lawyers will file a suit at the courthouse. The suit for crimes against humanity is 150 pages long, with three annexes containing hundreds of documents. Symbolically, the victim's Chadian lawyer is presenting it to the prosecutor. We filed the suit. Now it's up to the justice system to do its work. These and other victims want the former dictator to be tried here in Dakar for crimes against humanity. But two weeks later, there's a bombshell. In an interview in a Spanish newspaper, the Senegalese president, Abdoulaye Awad, issues a threat. He warns there will be no Habre trial unless Senegal receives 40 million US dollars from the international community and quickly. This is all the more astonishing since the European Union has already agreed to finance the trial but is waiting for a realistic budget. But do the authorities in Senegal really have the political will to try Hissène Habre? Ten years of red tape and legal proceedings, hundreds of victims' testimonies gathered, thousands of documents seized, and three lawsuits. Apparently all in vain as Habre continues to enjoy a comfortable retirement in Dakar, with no indication that he'll ever stand trial. So that, that was, those are clips from a movie that was made of, in 2009 at a, at a different, uh, when, when, when we were still hoping. Hissène Abre has been called the Pinochet of Africa. He ruled Chad with an iron fist for eight years. He's accused of human rights violations, including imprisonment without trial. Um, so, um, I, what I'll do is, is, is I'll briefly go over the, the, the long history of this case. Um, uh, and this is the, f the first case that I've, we've used in, at Human Rights Watch in, in a press release, the word labyrinthian. Um, and maybe, you know, look at some of the, in particular, the international aspects and, and make a few observations and then leave time for questions. Um, Hissène Habre, as, as you see here, was the dictator of Chad in the 1980s. He was uh, supported, actually, it was the, uh, by the United States as a bulwark against Muammar Gaddafi. Um, the first uh, uh, covert operation of the Ronald Reagan era before the Contras in Nicaragua, before Jonas Savimbi, was bringing Hissen Habre to power in, 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 in Chad. Um, and Habre, uh, with, with U.S. support, Habre actually defeated uh, Libya, defeated Gaddafi in, in a war, um, but then basically turned his country into a police state uh, uh, he is accused, as you see in this in, in that movie, uh, tr by the Truth Commission, of up to 40,000 political killings and systematic torture. Um, uh, before he was overthrown by his former um, uh, commander in chief, Idris Deby, uh, who is still today president of Chad, and, and then Hissène Habre fled Chad uh, with U.S. support. Uh, they found him exile in Senegal. Um, and that's probably where he would have stayed had it not been for the case that Juan mentioned, um, the case of Augusto Pinochet. And when uh, we got involved at Human Rights Watch in the Pinochet case, we realized that you know, we had a, a new tool, uh, universal jurisdiction, uh, to bring to justice um, those who seemed out of the reach of justice. And really the Pinochet case was a galvanizing moment for those of us in the human rights movement um, who saw that there was, there was actually the possibility of um, using justice um, to, to bring uh, people like that. Um, and, and much has been discussed about the justice cascade in Latin America that followed the arrest of General Pinochet. But this case is, is a really a direct result as well. Um, we were approached by uh, a Chadian, the head of the Chadian um, Association for Human Rights, um, who, who, who asked us if we could not also um, uh, work with, with, with 
uh, Habre's victims to bring him to justice. And what interested us at Human Rights Watch about the Habre case um, was uh, that he was in Senegal. Um, and as, as we looked at how to, um, how to deepen the Pinochet precedent, um, we thought that, you know, if, if, that if, if this was really going to be international universal principle, that it, should, that it shouldn't just be the Spains and the Englands and the Belgians of the world uh, who exercised universal jurisdiction, but the countries of the South um, should step up to the plate uh, and uh, uh, employ universal jurisdiction. Habre was in Senegal, which was, it still is considered to be one of the leading African countries in terms of respect for human rights and ratifying all the conventions and, and, and the like. And so you, at Human Rights Watch, we decided to try to make uh, uh, Hissen Habre uh, the, and as you see in that movie, he's kind of become to be known as the African Pinochet, even though he actually has very little, I mean, it, knowing the situation, very little actually ideologically or otherwise to do with, with Augusto Pinochet. But it was, it was an interesting shorthand way of explaining that we were seeking to do uh, uh, with, uh, with a dictator, um, to bring a dictator to justice in another country. And, and it was at the time that Pinochet was, was in London uh, that uh, we began working with the Chadian groups and the Senegalese groups to file this case against Havre in Senegal. And um, I won't, obviously I don't, we don't have time for a blow by blow. You've, you've, there, there were considerable readings. Um, but we helped the Chadians come to Senegal um, uh, we had a collective of Senegalese lawyers. We filed a case um, in Senegal based on uh, the work of the Truth Commission and investigations that we had carried out. Uh, and much to our surprise, a Senegalese judge actually indicted Habre uh, for uh, crimes of torture and crimes against humanity uh, and, and put him under house arrest. Um, unfortunately, at that point, politics began to get the upper hand. There was an election in Senegal. President Abdoulaye Wad was elected uh, president. Uh, he brought with him as his personal lawyer, the lawyer of Hassan Habre. Um, Habre also left Chad uh, with the contents of his country's treasury. Um, just as Idris Deby's troops were marching on, uh, were marching on Jemena, uh, Habre brought together his central bankers and said, I need money to, to defend the capital. They handed him uh, tens of millions of dollars, and he took that money and he went to Senegal with that money. Um, and so he's used that money to build himself a web of protection in Senegal, putting himself under the protection of the leading uh, Muslim uh, religious figures, um, making friends with many of the rich and powerful people in Senegal. and and. When his lawyers filed a motion to dismiss the case, um, they argued that uh, Senegal, even though Senegal had ratified the torture convention, which as Juan said is, was designed to prevent uh, uh, torturers from escaping the consequences of their acts by going to another country and finding safe haven, even though Senegal had ratified that treaty, they hadn't incorporated it into their domestic law. And so Senegalese courts did not have the competence um, to prosecute extraterritorial crimes. And that decision was upheld by Senegal's highest court. Um, in the meantime, we, we saw which way the wind was blowing. Um, and we started looking around for other places uh, that uh, 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 we, could, we could file Habre's case. And, and at the time, uh, Belgium, together with Spain, um, had the widest and most generous universal jurisdiction law in the world, the law that permitted uh, victims to file cases uh, for, for international crimes, even when there was no connection uh, with Belgium, and even when uh, the alleged perpetrator wasn't on Belgian soil. And in that respect, only Belgium and Spain um, had laws that didn't require the presence of the perpetrator. Um, we filed the case in Belgium. Um, we, uh, before filing the case, 
uh, we, the, we, we worked with the Chadian community um, to, in, 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 in Paris, actually, to locate a number of Chadians, uh, 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 victims uh, who, were, who, had, who had adopted Belgian nationality. It wasn't a necessary step at the time under the law, but it was a politically important step um, in order to um, develop support for the case in Belgium. Um, President Wad then in Senegal said uh, that Hissen Habre had to leave Senegal. Um, right after the decision of the Senegalese highest court um, uh, throwing out the prosecution, President Wad went on the radio to say that he had given Hissen Habre 30 days to leave Senegal. Um, we were actually upset by that because we figured that he would probably go somewhere, we actually knew where, that he would go to some place like Saudi Arabia um, where we would never uh, be able to catch up to him. And so the victims, uh, we were at that point preparing a petition to the UN Committee Against Torture uh, against Senegal, uh, charging it with violating its obligations under the Torture Convention. Um, and we added to that petition a request for preliminary measures uh, for uh, Senegal to be enjoined not to uh, expel Hissen Habre and not to allow him to leave Senegal um, other than through an extradition request. And the Committee Against Torture in, in, in the case of Gang Gang versus Senegal granted that kind of those, those preliminary measures. Um, Senegal said that they, President Wad at first said that he seemed to ignore that that had happened, but Kofi Annan then interceded with President Wad, and President Wad said that he would hold his Habre in Senegal until there was an extradition request. Um, at that point, we, the case then moved to Belgium. Um, the Belgian law uh, started at that point to become a victim of its own generosity. Um, there are, as you know, many human rights atrocities in the world. There are many victims in the world, and there are very few places they can find justice. Um, and uh, many of them began, as we did, to go to Belgium and to Spain. Um, uh, we could have a longer discussion about universal jurisdiction, um, but the Belgian law uh, began to, uh, as I said, become the victim of its own success in the sense that there were some 30 or 35 cases um, brought against top sitting officials uh, in Belgium. Um, Yasser Arafat, Ariel Sharon, uh, seven or eight African heads of state, Rafsan Jani of Iran. Um, uh, the first case that made it very difficult for, 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 for Belgium was the case against Ariel Sharon, um, which created um, uh, for, the, for, the, for the unsolved, for the, un, um, the unaddressed massacre in a, uh, in a Palestinian refugee camp in Shabra and Shatila. Um, uh, that caused difficulties in Belgium's bilateral relations with Israel. Um, uh, but what really made it uh, very difficult for Belgium was when cases were filed against U.S. officials uh, for, uh, related to the first Gulf War. And uh, basically Donald Rumsfeld came to Belgium. Remember, I was teaching here at, 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 this moment, at the time when Donald Rumsfeld came to Belgium. And, and basically said that if American, that if NATO officials could not come to Belgium uh, without worrying about being sued, um, that maybe uh, it was time to think about moving NATO outside of Belgium. And at that point, the law began to crumble uh, like a house of cards. There was also, as, as those of you uh, studying international law will remember, there was also the case brought by the DRC against Belgium, the Erodia case, in which the International Court of Justice found that Belgium's arrest warrant for the sitting foreign minister of Belgium, of, uh, of the DRC, violated uh, Belgi uh, uh, DRC's uh, immunities. Uh, and so there was a, a lot of popular pressure, political pressure, to, to, um, to repeal that universal jurisdiction law. Together with other uh, human rights organizations in Belgium, we began a defense of the universal jurisdiction law. And, and a key point of that defense was bringing to Belgium victims. 
uh, people whose cases were being heard uh, by the Belgian court. Um, by that time, a Belgian judge had, or the Belgian investigating judge had gone to Ch Ch Chad. One of my, one of the most uh, amazing experiences I've had as a lawyer was being in Chad when a Belgian judge, uh, a team of policemen, a prosecutor, went to Chad to investigate the complaints against his and Habre. Um, and you had people, when we began the Habre case, uh, one of the victims uh, said to us, um, depuis quand la justice est-elle venue au Chad? Like, when, since when has justice ever come to Chad? And at that moment, when you had this Belgian team investigating in Chad, one had the impression that really justice had come. And people were lining up around the courthouse to, to, to be interviewed by the judge. And the judge went, uh, this was, in, in legal terms, this was known as, as letters rogatory, a commission rogatoire, where the judge and his Chadian counterpart were interviewing witnesses, confronting witnesses, uh, confronting victims with the people who tortured them, uh, going to the sites of these mass graves, going to some of these prisons. For, for Chad, it was, it, the place was an effervescence to have this happen. And a number of the um, victims, actually people who had never come forward before as victims, came forward, some of them walking past their former torturers, who were still in the police guarding the courthouse, to testify. And so when the move came in Belgium to repeal the universal jurisdiction law, some of these victims came up to Belgium and said, well, you can't do this. You sent us a judge. We believed that you were going to bring us justice. Um, you can't just pull that back now. And, and this had a huge impact um, uh, on, on the Belgian political class. I mean, they met with the foreign minister and the justice minister and the head of the National Assembly. And so when the law was repealed, uh, when the universal jurisdiction law was repealed, there were transitory provisions put in the law um, that allowed this case to go forward. It didn't say in this case, but it was, it was drafted in a way that allowed the Hiss and Habre case to move forward. And uh, finally, after four years, a Belgian judge uh, indicted Habre, and, uh, and and Belgium asked for his extradition. This was night. This was 2005. Uh, at that point, Senegal, which had promised to hold Habre until somebody came to seek his extradition, President Wad um, uh, thought better of it, uh, and uh, went to the Afri the, the the extradition request went. Habre was actually arrested, um, but the extradition court ruled that it could not uh, decide on his extradition because he was a former head of state, um, citing the Erodian decision. Um, I forgot to mention that in all of this, after the Erodia decision uh, came down, of course, Erodia was dealing with sitting foreign ministers, sitting officials, but there's dicta, as many of you know, in the Erodia decision, paragraph 61, um, that implies that even Former officials, presidents, foreign ministers, and the like, would have immunity for all but their private acts. Uh, something, a, a, a dicta that seems in, in, in direct contradiction to the decision of the House of Lords in the Pinochet case. Um, at that point, though, the Chadian NGOs who worked with us swung into action, and they actually got the Chadian government um, to write to the Belgian judge to waive Hissen Habre's immunity um, in what I believe was the first case outside of the Alien Tort Claims Act here in the United States in which a government actually waived the immunity of a former president for human rights. Uh, so the, Chad, the decision by the, by the um, uh, by, the, by the Senegalese court that it couldn't decide on the extradition because of his purported immunities obviously um, has no basis in law because the immunity, as, as the Eurodia decision also said, immunities do not belong to the state, um, to the state, to the former state official, they belong to the state. And if the state waives 
those immunities, the official cannot assert them. Um, but it was obviously, once again, a politically motivated decision by the Senegalese court in order to give President Wad a free hand to do basically what he wanted. And President Wad went to the African Union and said, what should, basically, what should I do with this in Havre? And the African Union created a committee of experts. The committee of experts um, uh, began to deliberate. And just when they, just before their deliberations, the UN Committee Against Torture gave its final ruling in the case of Gang Gang versus Senegal, in which the Committee Against Torture ruled that, uh, his, that, that Senegal had violated uh, its obligations under the UN Convention Against Torture and uh, called on Senegal to prosecute or extradite his Havre. And meeting just a week later, the African Committee of Jurists said, well, uh, we don't, you know, we want to see Havre prosecute, we want to see him prosecute in Africa, so therefore it's up to Senegal to prosecute his Havre. Um, the African uh, Union head, heads of state met they approved that decision. They called on Senegal to prosecute Hissen Habre in the name of Africa. This is 2006. Um, President Wad said he would do that. Senegal then uh, amended its laws, the laws that had been found not to permit Habre's prosecution because they didn't permit extraterritorial prosecutions. Senegal amended its law. Now, actually, Senegal has replaced Spain and replaced Belgium as the country with the widest extradition law in the world. Um, it does not require the presence of the alleged perpetrator um, or any other connection to Senegal. Um, the problem with these laws, of course, is that you have to use them. Um, and Senegal then said, well, OK, we've agreed to prosecute Habre, but we haven't agreed to pay for the trial. And this trial is going to cost, six, first they started with 66 million euros, so like 100 million dollars. And they came down to 27 million euros. And we spent two or three years um, both getting Senegal down and getting international donors um, to, to uh, agree to finance the trial. Uh, we were just about to go to a donors meeting. We finally got the African Union, the European Union, and Senegal to agree on, a, on an $11.7 million budget for the trial. Um, when Habre went to uh, an international court, a court I have to admit that I had never even heard of, called the uh, Court of Justice of the ECOWAS community. And this is a court that sits in Abuja um, that doesn't require that you exhaust domestic remedies. Um, and Habre went to the uh, uh, Abuja court and said, Senegal is about to, about to prosecute. They haven't done anything yet, but they're about to prosecute me um, using laws that they just uh, adopted. And this is a violation of the principle of non-retroactivity. Um, now, I will bet that everybody in this room, everybody in this room knows that that's not a good argument. That everybody in this room knows that Article 15, Sections 1 and 2 of the ICCPR provide um, that the principle of non-retroactivity only applies to acts that were not criminal in national or international law at the time, uh, and that they do not apply to acts that at the time of their act commission were considered um, illegal by the general body of international law. But the, inter but the, the ECOWAS court didn't know that. Um, and the, uh, the ECOWAS court um, ruled uh, that in order not to breach the principle of non-retroactivity of criminal law, that Senegal would be could only prosecute Habre before a special ad hoc procedure of an international character. Um, it purported to find a, a, an international custom um, that required uh, that, oh, that, 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 that these kinds of cases um, be tried before international, internationalized courts. Um, again, this was a case where nothing had happened yet. So 
the court first had to deal with the fact that there was no injury, but it said that the likelihood of injury uh, was there. Um, this is, a, again, a court that doesn't require exhaustion of domestic remedies. There had been no, no uh, 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 airing of these claims in Senegal. And it's a court whose rulings are binding, unlike the Committee Against Torture. Um, and um, so the courts essentially said, as I said, that Senegal had to create, and they also, um, they, they looked at the African Union's ruling. Uh, the African Union, and I'm going to quote the African Union's decision, uh, the African Union had called on Senegal to prosecute and ensure that Hissen Habre is tried on behalf of Africa by a competent Senegalese court. The, the ECOWAS said, well now, the African Union said he should be tried, and they put in quotes, by a competent court. And each time they quoted competent by a competent court, each time they left out the word Senegalese in quoting the African Union's decision. They said, well, you know what they really meant was that Senegal should figure out a way that he should be tried by a court. And, 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 and the only way that, uh, that he can do so, that Senegal can do so, consistent with the ICCP, consistent with the principle of non-retroactivity, is by trying him before an international court. Well, this obviously threw everything into, it seemingly threw everything into disarray. Um, the African Union, though, which I have to say has, has played a very positive role in this, immediately came up with a solution, uh, which was to create, along the Cambodia model, a uh, extraordinary chambers in the courts of Senegal, and actually looked at this as a way to solve the problem of money rather than create a problem of money. Our, our concern with the ECOWAS decision was, of course, we, we knew we had $11.7 million to play with. Um, an international court, you know, you can begin the bidding at $100 million. Um, and, you know, once you, once you, uh, when, you know, once you put in an international judge, it costs like $500,000 a year for one international judge when you put in all of the, actually, it's 300, I think it's $350,000 a year. But, um, and what we, what the, the, the brilliance of actually the African Union solution was that it actually potentially provided a solution that was less costly. Because one of the, one of the, one of the headaches we've had with, with putting together a budget for the Havre case um, has been the juxtaposition of international justice with the French legal system, which has the principe de l'égalité, which means that whenever there's a crime, you have to prosecute that crime. And as we know from the Milosevic and other international justice experiences, if you try to prove all of the crimes, of a dictator who lasted for eight years, you're looking at zillions of dollars to be to, to, to round up, um, and and many years. Whereas an international court, um, in which you actually limit the competence of the court um, to the most severe crimes, as they have in many of, as they do in Sierra Leone and other courts, can actually be done for less money. So the African Union presented this to Senegal. Senegal said no. Senegal said, no, this, this isn't good enough for ECOWAS. We, this isn't a real international court. And Senegal walked out of the discussions. Um, at that point, uh, the victims who for a long time just wanted to get this case out of Senegal um, uh, were able at that point to really s start to argue that the only possible way to bring this and Havre to justice was to extradite him to Belgium. And thanks to the work that we had done um, in, uh, when in, the, in defense of the universal jurisdiction law, the case in Belgium has a, a very, very strong popular support um, that we have cultivated over the years. The victims have made many trips to Belgium. Um, each time uh, we have met with people from across the political spectrum in Belgium, as you may, may or may not know, um, there is a very complicated political system, and there's a six-party government. Um, uh, each of the, 
the, there is somebody within each of those six parties who is very interested in this case and supports the case. Um, Belgium took the amazing step of taking Senegal to the International Court of Justice. Um, as you know, cases at the International Court of Justice are few and far between. Uh, maybe one or two or three cases are filed each year. They're almost always filed. They're almost always based on uh, a, a, the deep national interest of the country over, what's the case you have with Uruguay there? Over, over pollution, over, over it's a, uh, what? It's a paper mill. It's a paper mill that's polluting the river. Um, or they're trying to take away your islands, like between that and Nigeria and Cameroon, or they're trying, I mean, stuff that really goes to the heart of national sovereignty and, and economic interest. It's very, very rare for a country to go to the International Court of Justice um, to uphold a fairly abstract right of some victims who only, you know, became Belgian nationals after they were tortured um, to justice. Um, and, and, but, Belgium, bless its quirky um, little heart, brought this case to the International Court of Justice, um, and and there and 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 basically put um, you know put the case on a totally different footing. Now we always assumed when the case was filed that this was more a sort of Damocles, that this was not actually something that was going to to that that a decision from the ICJ would take years to get and that we weren't really going to wait for that to happen. But this case has taken so long that we're now sitting here waiting for the judgment of the, of the International Court of Justice. Um, uh, uh, last year, um, the, um, as I said, um, um, uh, uh, also, in, so in the last few months, we've had several major developments in the case. First was were the hearings before the International Court of Justice. Um, it was quite clear uh, to me and to others that uh, Sen that Belgium had proved that Senegal had failed in its in, in discharging its its duty to extradite or prosecute Habre. Um, but the ICJ is a very conservative court, a very conservative court, um, and I wouldn't want to prejudge um, uh, how they will rule on a lot of the procedural issues that may come up. What is Belgium's right uh, to bring the case? Um, what, um, uh, whether or not um, the, the various prerequisites to getting to the court, arbitration and everything had been, um, had been fulfilled. But it was quite clear, I have to say that, that uh, it, it was quite clear, uh, I think even to the judges, uh, that Senegal um, had not fulfilled it, its duties. Um, at the same time, uh, the, uh, the, a week after the uh, hearings ended at the ICJ. There were elections in Senegal which brought to power a new government um, which now says that it wants to try his in Havre in Senegal, um, which has creates a big kind of conundrum for the victims here because we would have all liked to see his in Havre prosecuted in Senegal. Um, but at this point, time is really of the essence. Um, many of the victim, many of the surviving victims have died. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, if Senegal is now to prosecute Habre, they would have to go back and create an ECOWAS compliant structure. They would then have to begin the investigation again. Um, and so we're looking, they would have to go back and, 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 and the money would have to be repledged because the money was pledged several years ago and people have to redo their budgets. And so you know, my Jacqueline Mudena, the lawyer who you see in the, in, the, in, in the movie there, met with the Senegalese Minister of Justice a few weeks ago, and the Minister of Justice said that she wanted to see Habre, that she was embarrassed by what the previous government had done, uh, and that she wanted to make up for it and to see Habre prosecuted in Senegal. And Jacqueline said, if you really want to do right by the victims, if you really want to see justice done, uh, then you should extradite him to, to to, to Belgium. Um, uh, uh, maybe I'll 
I'll, I'll, I'll kind of I'll, I'll kind of wrap up here. I mean, a couple of lessons that I have from this. One, there's a great benefit to universal jurisdiction, which is that the victims and and groups like mine that support the victims, we are the architects of the procedure. Um, unlike before international courts, um, uh, the victims it's the victims who determine the litigation strategy in ways um, that would never happen in international tribunal. I mean, the political um, and diplomatic trade-offs that are always going to be made in these kinds of cases are made by Jacqueline Mudena, Reed Brody, Suleiman Gengeng, not Luis, Luis Moreno Ocampo, um, the Assembly of States Parties, um, etc. And I think that is a very important and healthy thing. I mean, as in the Pinochet case, um, it's the victims who are who, who drive the process. Um, the problem, though, of course, is that you don't have a state behind you. You don't have an international institution behind you. I mean, you know, a friend of mine said to me, Reed, I mean, Hissen Habre, there's no state supporting him. He spent 10 years on this case, and you can't get him to justice. Um, you know, there is... Um, uh, it's much more difficult when it's only civil society actors um, uh, who, are, who are doing this. You need to create the political will in, in, in you know, what Diane Ortlicker calls a bystander state um, to prosecute. I mean, in, in the Pinochet case was able to, to move forward because there was a particular confluence of political uh, uh, dynamics. I mean, in, in the Pinochet case was able to, to move forward because for, for 15 years, the Chilean victims had kept alive the memory of what Pinochet had done. Uh, when Pinochet was arrested, everyone in Spain knew who General Pinochet was and why he should be prosecuted. And there was very strong support in Spain for the Pinochet prosecutors, even though the conservative government was against it. Same way as in, in England, the election of Tony Blair had made his actual arrest possible. Um, and so in order to, to succeed in uni unity universal jurisdiction, you need to create the political conditions in the forum state, which by definition is not the state where the crimes took place. We've been able to create those political conditions in Belgium. We've had much less success in, in Senegal, although this film was actually shown on TV, the longer, I mean, the full version of this film was shown on Senegalese TV um, on a number of occasions and, and actually has, had, I think, political opinion is in our favor in Senegal, but not, hasn't been enough. Um, when the case first got to the ICJ, uh, 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 there was, Belgium had sought preliminary measures, um, again, to prevent Habre from leaving the country. Um, Senegal promised that it would not let Habre leave, um, and so the preliminary measures were not granted. But in, in his opinion in that case, um, our colleague Consado Trinidadji wrote, of the saga of the victims of the Habre regime in their persistent struggle against impunity. And he, he cited um, se uh, from Seneca and talked about, and he lamented the gap between the time of human beings and the time of human justice. For those victimized, he said, the passing of time without justice is painful, as it is time leading to despair. Victims of torture are only left with that hope in human justice. The surviving victims of the atrocities of the Habre regime keep on waiting for justice. Hope is the last one to vanish. So I will stop with Consagio's time. Many thanks, Reed. Uh, <clears throat> We have a, about, about a half hour, I think, uh, maybe a little more for questions and answers. Uh, following Betsy's instructions, uh, we need you to use the microphone and also to identify yourselves uh, before you, you ask your question or make your comment. So, um, which microphone do we have? That one? I guess this one. This one, here. Yeah. Should you can ask the first question? No, 
My name is Claudia Martina, I'm co-director of the Academy. I'm very glad that we organized this event. I think it's a fantastic case to discuss human rights uh, protections and the um, quest of victims to seek for justice. And so I'm, we are very thankful for both, both of you for being here. I know that you don't want to discuss about the ICJ because of course it's very prudent. However, I want to ask you to see if you would like to say a few things. Um, I'm very personally, I was very concerned with the decision of the ICJ in the Germany versus Italy case and I'm sure I should be a concern to the victims in this case and I wanted to know if you wanted to say something about it. You know, I, I think that this case Maybe you should explain the German versus Italy. Maybe you can explain the German <laughs> versus <laughs> 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 uh, I think Claudia refers to a recent decision by the International Court of Justice that uh, uh, Germany brought against Italy for a case called Ferrini and, uh, and against Greece also. It's a two, two yeah. cases for atrocities committed by uh, occupation forces during World War II. Uh, essentially, uh, deportation to Germany for slave labor during World War II of Italian citizens. And in Italy, courts had uh, awarded, uh, uh, had ruled against Germany, not against individuals, but against the German state, as I understand it. And Germany then brought this case, and if I understand correctly, the International Court of Justice uh, ruled in favor of Germany and said that Italy could not uh, exercise jurisdiction in this case, it wasn't even universal jurisdiction. Uh, uh, some of the events at least had happened in Italy. And uh, at worst, it was uh, passive personality jurisdiction because the victims were Italian. Is, did I get it right, more or less? Thank you. Yeah, um, um, it's interesting because obviously that was in a lot of people's minds. And it's interesting that the case was never cited um, until towards the very end, answer to one, and I'm trying to remember, it was cited on a different issue. It was not cited for the ruling on immunities or on jurisdiction. It was, uh, and so it didn't really seem to play a role directly in the case. Um, I mean, here that, I mean, I have to say it's kind of open and shut in terms of the substantive law. I mean, the, the torture convention is, is very clear. Um, I, I, I I say off, off the record, um, <laughs> I guess it's nothing, never mind. Um, I mean, Belgium made some, I thought, very large, it's, it's interesting, I have to say, to, to as an American lawyer, um, we are trained to make very narrow arguments before a court. Um, Belgium did not make narrow arguments. Belgium tried to move the goal, move the ball on things like customary, tried to find a customary international law duty to extradite or prosecute. Um, I thought um, it, 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 um, you know, it, uh, they made many arguments that I, I, I suspect the court may not follow. Um, on the core of what the torture convention requires, it would seem to be, the law would seem to be pretty clear. Um, interestingly, the judges, I think, asked more questions than they had ever asked in a case before. Um, and, and I think partly this was due to Senegal's failure to make some of the arguments it could have made. Um, but most of the questions revolve either around customary international law or around, really, Belgium standing. Um, and whether or not Belgium as a country that had ratified the torture convention after all these crimes took place, um, uh, that whose was not represent who was rep whose direct interest in the case was only on behalf of, peop of of citizens who had become Belgian after the acts in question. Um, to me, those were not, I mean, none of those arguments sh should prevail. Um, uh, I think Belgium acted to uphold the purpose of the torture convention, um, which is, as Juan said, to, to prevent torturers from escaping the consequence of their act. Had Belgium not acted in this case, um, these acts of torture would be 
uh, would be unaddressed. Um, uh, under the principles of state responsibility, um, Belgium doesn't need to be defending the acts, to be defending its own, its own victims. Um, and the fact that they ratified the convention after the torture in question, but they didn't ratify it after the violation in question, which was the failure of Senegal to extradite or prosecute. Um, and, and, I mean, Senegal is not charged with having tortured Hissen Habre, but with having, bought, with having um, uh, um, failed to uh, uh, abide by its responsibilities under Articles 5, 6, and 7 of the Torture Convention. And those violations took place after all the countries in question, both countries in question, um, had the, the, my, my, my larger concern, actually, is what remedy the court is going to order. Um, we had hoped uh, that Belgium would request the court to order extradition to Belgium, um, given the, at the time, and this was before the election in Senegal, uh, th that Senegal had said we are not going to, had said flatly we are not going to prosecute him in Senegal. Um, uh, my guess is that s the court will not force Senegal, will not order Senegal to take one option or the other. That the court will just reaffirm Senegal's obligation, will say that hopefully will say that Senegal has violated the treaty and that Senegal must extradite or prosecute. Um, hopefully, I mean, Belgium asked Senegal, to, Belgium asked the court to say that they must immediately prosecute or extradite without further delay. So they put in a time element. Um, I don't know whether the court will go for that, whether it will just say you have to extradite or prosecute. If they say that, we really haven't gotten that far down the field because Senegal will just say, well, yeah, that's what we're doing. Um, and then we will be left to, you know, post-judgment kinds of measures. Other question? Well, let, let me follow up, up on this one. Um, I don't quite understand why is the question of Belgium standing an issue. Uh, has Senegal counterclaimed that uh, Belgium doesn't have a good basis for jurisdiction? No, actually, it's interesting because Senegal did not make any of the arguments that I thought. All the questions of the Belgium standing came from the judges. The very first question, I have to say that, that we were, I mean, obviously, in a sense, we were rooting for Belgium. Um, and when Senegal was finished, it was like, that's all they have. And um, the very first question came from uh, Judge Abraham, and he said, as soon as he opens his mouth, my goes like this. His very first question is, La Belgique a-t-elle la qualité? Belgium doesn't have the, the quality um, to defend people who were tortured only uh, after they, who, who became Belgian. Uh, I mean, again, I think under the Articles on State Responsibility, the answer is clear. It doesn't matter. He, the, 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 the obligations of the Torture Convention even though I don't like to throw these words around, our obligations erga omnis. I mean, you sign a multilateral treaty, anybody, even, even you know, the United States could enforce that. Um, uh, so I don't think that, Bel and in addition, though, uh, Belgium has, I think, very specific, uh, uh, a very specific quality, which is that it does, in fact, have sort of victims, that it has relied on Senegal's um, promises over the years, that it has requested mutual legal assistance, that it has requested extradition. Um, so I'm fairly comfortable that that's not a winning argument, but the fact that Judge Abraham, um, who's one of the senior judges from France, um, should ask that, did kind of, you know, disturb my tranquility, yes. <laughs> Questions? Any other intervention? No, it was quite, uh, when, I, when I was in the case, uh, going back to the Pinochet case, it, it was very, you know, 15 years earlier, I had sat in the House of Lords while 
you know, lawyers debated the fate of Augusto Pinochet, and in which we were not parties to the case. Um, and 15 years later, I sat in the International Court of Justice, which, if possible, is a more conservative court than the House of Lords, um, while two countries debated the fate of another former dictator. And it was, I just, I, just, it, 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 I think to have gotten there, frankly, to just for, for, we were sitting there with Jacqueline and Suleiman Gengeng, and, and I think it, it was even for them some measure of justice just to have two, two weeks of argument before the International Court of Justice over the Hiss and Habre case, in which day after day they were citing Geng Geng versus Senegal. Day after day they were citing this long quest for justice. Um, and obviously it, it doesn't, I mean, what we want is to see a trial, but even that was, was some measure of, of satisfaction. Absolutely. Um, the, uh, the distinction that the House of Lords uh, made. I'm sorry, you have a question? No, you go ahead. No, 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 uh, no I can't. I'll take my turn. Don't, don't. No, no, please go ahead after you. Okay. The distinction that the House of Lords made about uh, torture and international torture, or extraterritorial torture, uh, you know, which I found troubling, you know, uh, at least from a. Uh, from a, a a deontological, uh, an, object, uh, an ob uh, objective based uh, analysis of why do states uh, uh, open their courts for universal jurisdiction for torture. Uh, is that going to play, uh, or did it play any role in the discussion? No, although the one, I mean, the, the two questions, there were two questions on retroactivity um, that, I mean, as, you know, I mean, the House. In the House of Lords, in, in its second ruling, absurdly, in our view, of course, ruled that uh, uh, Britain could only prosecute crimes of torture, extradite. extradite for crimes of torture, once all the countries in question had, for torture, had. To. Um, actually, Senegal ratified the. Senegal only ratified the torture convention in 19, Havre uh, was the president from 82 to 90. Senate, the torture convention only came into effect in 1987. Um, so one of the questions by Judge, O'Donna, Judge Donahue from the United States, she asked the two retroactivity questions, um, was whether or not that was relevant to the case. Um, and there does seem actually to, well, first of all, it doesn't matter because Kyrie tortured a lot of people between 1987 and 1990. So the bottom line to me is it doesn't matter. Um, and I, I was, it's very interesting because I was, the whole time we were, I mean, we had this interplay with, the, obviously the Belgians, we were not parties to the case, which is, as you can imagine is very frustrating, um, uh, just as in the House of Lords. But you know, we were always proposing arguments to the Belgians. We spent a lot of time proposing things to the Belgians. And all of the things we were proposing to the Belgians were narrow, narrow, narrow. Um, you know, don't. And basically, you know, we didn't really care about, I mean, the, obviously, we, we don't want to make bad law on retroactivity. Um, but if you look at the decisions of the Committee Against Torture, particularly the very first decision relating to Argentina, um, the Committee Against Torture said that the obligations of the convention were not retroactive. Um, and so it's hard for me to see how the, House of, uh, how the ICJ is going to find Senegal in violation of its international obligations for not giving retroactive application with respect to torture committed before 1987. Um, but as I said, ultimately it doesn't matter because most of actually the bad things that Havre did were happened between 87 and 90, which the Belgians also made clear to the court. Go ahead. I have a, a, a more general question. Judy Gilmore, I'm on the board of the International Association of Women Judges and Mediators Beyond Borders. 
both of which are interested in this issue. But my question is more general. But first I want to say I am in total awe of your commitment and persistence in this case. <laughs> it's just, just wonderful. Um, and thank you for your presentation. But I'm interested in the implications of this case for the whole universal jurisdiction doctrine. And from what you said, it sounds like there are only now two countries that will, will be able to implement the doctrine, Senegal and Spain, as Belgium has already um, repealed the doctrine. Could, could you talk yeah. more generally about the implications and where this doctrine can be implemented and what you see as the future? Sure. Um, no, Belgium and, Sp I mean, Belgium and Spain were, were the only two countries that allowed cases to be filed if the, uh, let's say on the basis of pure universal jurisdiction. So that the, um, a case could be filed in Spain against Augusto Pinochet even though he wasn't there and there were no Spanish victims, although there were. And, um, but now, actually, since the creation of the International Criminal Court and the implementation by most countries of domestic legislation, adapting legislation, almost every country has some, including the United States, has universal jurisdiction once the alleged perpetrator comes onto your territory. So if a former torturer, if a torturer comes to the United States, under US law, the US can arrest that person and prosecute him or her for, for torture committed abroad. So there is um, pretty much every country, um, or most countries have. Now there's an interesting, I mean, frankly, the promise, in my view, of Pinochet that uh, has not largely been fulfilled. Uh, back when the Pinochet case happened, we kind of saw this new world in which, you know, people were going to be arrested right and left, and, and, and people were going to stop traveling, and then, and um, there's an interesting article, which is one of the articles they gave out for the readings here by Maximo Langer in the American Journal of International Law, that basically concludes that um, both the, the expectations and the fears of universal jurisdiction have not been realized. That it's basically, if you look at the people who have been prosecuted under universal jurisdiction in the last 15 years, they're basically Nazis, Hutus, and Serbs. Um, and a couple of Argentines in Spain, yeah. and a couple of Argentines in Spain. Um, and that these are people who Maximo Langer refers to as low-cost defendants, people whom the international community has decided should be prosecuted, and whose state of nationality is not standing up for them. Um, and so, I mean, we haven't seen any, I mean, Hissen Habre is the only other head of state, and, and practically the only other high-ranking official um, to be now, I think that's the, that his he's 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 first of all doesn't I think he's a little mechanical in, in his in his analysis um, and doesn't look at um, the importance that I think uh, and I hope to have stressed here of creating the political conditions. Um, yes, I mean, clearly you're not going to prosecute somebody over a universal jurisdiction if the foreign country, if you don't have the political condition in the foreign country to do it. And that's why it's very easy to pick up a Rwandan uh, or, a, or a Serb um, or a Nazi. But you've got to create the political conditions um, in that country where you want, in order to get somebody higher. Now, we have in Spain, actually, I think you look at Spain and you see that there's a lot of support in Spain, for instance, again, not high, but for, for Guatemalan generals, for Salvadoran former presidents, because there's a connection between Spain and those countries. Um, in Spain, they refer to you know, the Tibet case, and those cases like Los Casos Exoticos, you know, cases that have nothing to do with Spain, and where you're not, it's much more difficult. So I think, I think that, you know, there is, I mean, we had also hoped to be, you know, that, that universal jurisdiction would be the equalizer in some way. You know, you're not going to, I mean, the, it's clear today that the International Criminal Court is not going to prosecute the crimes of, you know, Russia, China, and the United States. 
and the countries that, that are protected by those countries, like Sri Lanka or, or Israel or whatever. But you could use universal jurisdiction um, to address those. And we've seen that that's not, I mean, it's very, very difficult for the very same reasons. So, I mean, this, the, the, the Belgian law was, you know, cut down to size because of cases against Israel and the United States. The Spanish law, we didn't talk about this, but was also cut down. Um, I mean, it's still actually one of the best laws and probably the best law in Europe. But, you know, as, as long as it was, you know, Salvadorans and, and, and Saharawis and, and Guatemalans, the Spanish law was... But then when cases were filed over Tibet, over Gaza, and over Guantanamo, two years ago there was a consensus between the socialists and then in power and the conservatives to cut back that law. And, and then, you know, then you see what happened to Judge Garcon. Um, so, you know, there is what we have not, you know, we have not been able, essentially, to use universal jurisdiction. Now, it's true that, um, you know, I mean, we haven't been able to use it to bridge the impunity gap when it comes to powerful countries. I think we've been able to use it as a statement, as a threat. George Bush, we always just say, cancel the trip to Switzerland because there were cases filed there against him. Um, I think we are able to, you know, I have to say at this point, I, I, would, I was a, I was a concert, after, in, in, the, in the wake of Pinochet, I was a conservative. And I, I had taken, um, I had taken, at, when I went to Columbia Law School, I had studied with Jack Greenberg, from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who spent the semester explaining how they got, you know, how they overturned uh, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, and how they took the easiest case and then the next easiest case, and then until they finally got to Brown versus Board of Education. And I felt that's what we should do with universal jurisdiction. We shouldn't go after Henry Kissinger. We shouldn't go after Fidel Castro. We should go after Hiss and Habre and places like. And maybe one day we'll get to the point where we can get, you know, George Bush and people like that. I don't believe that anymore. Um, I don't believe we'll ever get to that point. Um, uh, but and, and I so I believe that you have to use the tools you have to make your legal arguments. And 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 I've been. We've, there's a case open in Guantanamo. Uh, a case open in Spain uh, over over alleged crimes in Guantanamo. Our Human Rights Watch report is evidence there. I've been called to testify. Um, I think we have to use these openings. Maybe we're not going to get high-ranking U.S. officials um, to uh, have to explain themselves, but I think we make a statement. We, we point out the contradictions that exist. Um, we, 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 we affirm the illegality of their actions by bringing them to courts. So it serves, I think, a number of purposes, even if it doesn't ultimately address um, the crimes before, a, you know, that it doesn't put defendants before a judge. Please. Uh, can you hand the... Oh, sorry. Okay, here's... Okay. Here, here. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, I just want to ask one question about the position of uh, Senegal uh, in view of the decision of ECOWAS Court of Justice because there's a provision in the revised treaty that is mandatory on all the member states to comply with the decision by the ECOWAS Court of Justice. In view of the decision of Harvey pending, uh, of Belgium pending in ICJ, how do you think uh, Senegal will be able to comply if it goes against the decision of ECOWAS Court of Justice? Because as I said, uh, it is an agreement of all the 15 member countries of uh, ECOWAS that any decision by 
the Equal Court of Justice must be complied with. How will they wriggle out of it? Well, it's a very a good question, and I'm, 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 I'm very much, first of all, looking forward to what the ICJ has to say about the ECOWAS decision. Um, uh, Senegal, well, first of all, Senegal can comply by extraditing Habre. The, the ECOWAS decision doesn't, you know, Senegal told, essentially Senegal's argument to the International Court of Justice was, we're trying to prosecute. But it's so hard now because we there's the ECOWAS decision and there's this and there's money and it's complicated. But they have two choices. They can prosecute or they can extradite. And as Belgium said, so in other words, Senegal has chosen to do A, but they can't do A. Well, they could do B. I mean, so they can, and, 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 and Senegal can comply, the, I, it, I mean, I, I encourage you, it, it doesn't exist in English, to read the ECOWAS decision if you can, because it's very difficult to actually divine exactly what, what it means. Um, but Senegal can either um, create an ECOWAS compliant court or it can extradite. Neither of those options are cut off. It's very interesting what, what Belgium, how Belgium dealt with the ECOWAS decision at the ICJ, because I think they didn't want to you know, take on the decision. They didn't want to, what they said is, the, basically their argument was that Senegal has brought the ECOWAS decision on itself um, by not having legislation in place in the, in the first instance in order to prosecute Habre. Because then they have to make legislation that ECOWAS then said was illegally retroactive. And had they had in place to begin with the appropriate legislation under the torture convention, they wouldn't have faced the dis they wouldn't have had that decision of ECOWAS. So basically, Belgium was saying the ECOWAS just didn't say it was the right decision or wrong. They did mention that it's been criticized. I mean, they, they, you can just look in some of the literature, and, and I mean, Bill Shabis, um, uh, who talked about called it a bizarre decision. Um, I mean, I've seen five law review articles so far, and they all five have used words like that um, to describe it. And it's unfortunate, actually, because the ECOWAS court had, in, in some other cases, it issued some very interesting decisions on slavery, on, on political freedoms and things. But this is, this is, anyway, the Senegal, I don't think that Senegal will ever be put in a position where it is, it is ordered to prosecute Habre without taking into, dis, into, in, into consideration the ECOWAS judgments. I don't think they'll ever actually be in a conflict of decisions, if you see what I mean. Okay, anyone else? Hi, uh, my name is David. I just wanted to follow up a bit on the ECOWAS Court of Justice decision. Uh, while it is a, a somewhat bizarre ruling, I wonder if you could speak to your thoughts on what it means for the principle of non-retroactivity, especially in the African context. Um, and it's, a, as you noted, a binding decision. Um, they grounded their decision in the African Charter, um, the right to life and the right to uh, possession, of uh, right to property, excuse me, and uh, continues somewhat of a trend, especially at the national level, of countries declaring the principle of legality to be a bar to the prosecution of what um, people like Human Rights Watch would consider an international customary legal obligation. Um, and I'm wondering if you see that as a, as a widening gap between Yuskogin's law and between some of the national jurisprudence coming out. Where else? Uh, Uganda, for example, um, has upheld the principle of legality as embedded within their constitution. Um, and I think ECOWAS, the way, it, I agree that it was a bizarre decision, but the way they framed it was, this is very much a national principle in line with the AU charter um, that this principle of non-retroactivity or legality is something upheld by the EU charter. And I was just wondering, do you see that as a widening gap? 
You know, the, the AU decision itself um, the, the Committee of Eminent African Jurists um, recommended that Senegal change its laws and try his and Habre. Um, so they didn't seem to be, cons I mean, none of us, to be honest, I mean, when, I have to say, I mean, I, I was unaware of the Ugandan decision, and, and I guess we were a little too, we weren't glib because we actually tried to intervene at ECOWAS. I mean, the victims, said, Habre sued Senegal. In, I mean, I don't want to dump on ECOWAS too badly, but, but we would not have known that this case had even been filed had somebody in the Senegalese government not told us, because there's no public notice of this stuff. Um, the victims then intervened, 114 victims sought to intervene um, it was ruled that they couldn't intervene. So we did, you know, we, we, we were, con but I have to say that we didn't really think that they would rule the way they did. Um, um, I mean, we were wrong, obviously. Um, uh, but, you know, the AU itself had recommended that Habre be prosecuted in Senegal um, on the basis of a report saying that they should do something. The UN Committee Against Torture had said Senegal must uh, uh, adapt its laws to cover the the alleged crimes of Fisson Harbor. So we didn't, re we just didn't see it coming, um, and uh, we were wrong. Um, is, is it possible to distinguish, for purposes of the principle of legality, between substantive criminal norms and uh, jurisdictional norms and procedural norms? Because at least in many countries, the principle of non-retroactivity doesn't apply to procedure, for example. And the question of whether it applies to jurisdiction or not is open to question. The people, you know, uh, believe that jurisdiction is a substantive norm. Others say that it's a third category. Uh, and I think, quite frankly, if we apply the principle of legality so rigidly, we, you know, Nuremberg would be a violation of the principle of legality. And so it may, it may seem to me that uh, here, what we're discussing is jurisdiction, not substance, not, uh, not the substantive offense of torture, for example, but whether a country can use its courts to, to uh, prosecute violations that were already included in the criminal code anyway. And uh, it seems to me that, uh, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that, 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 that distinction would uh, uh, be sufficient, because if you consider jurisdiction subject to non-retroactivity, then the solution posed by the ECOWAS court is also impossible to, to make, because you would be creating a court ex post facto anyway. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I mean, that's, yeah, that's the thing, that I, again, I, I, it, it, I find it even hard to, to address the, the, the ECOWAS decision, there are so many holes in it, but yeah, if, if it's a violation of the principle of legality to try him in Senegal, then it's a violation of the principle of legality to try him before a, an ad hoc international court. There's nothing, there's nothing specific about a, an international court um, that, that uh, uh, it's <laughs> I think this is a time when we can uh, close the proceedings. <laughs> That's because I have to go to another conference, but of course uh, I don't want that to be the reason. If there are other interventions, please go ahead. And if not, please join me in thanking uh, Sri.